Welcome back. We're in the initial stages of a topical study of the Bible doctrine of salvation. Perhaps one of the most important topics in all of the Bible, you know, what is involved in, in having a relationship with the creator of the universe. In the first class last week, I want to spend just a, <clears throat> excuse me, just a bit of time in review, bring us all up to speed. We spent some time last week just kind of defining terms, and it's important to do that in any study so that we don't talk past one another, that we understand kind of what's going on right at the beginning. So <clears throat> we highlighted, of course, the importance of the topic by just noting how often it's referred to in Scripture. The word save used at least 92 times in the New American Standard Bible and the New Testament, as well as the word salvation nearly 50 times as well. So over and over again, the New Testament writers refer to this particular topic. So it's important for us to understand very clearly what it means. We spent the rest of the time just highlighting how the word is used. And we talked about how it's important to read the Bible carefully and understand how a word is being used in, in various contexts. We talked about how, and we looked at some examples of how the word was used in, in uh, just a, a normal sense of use. When I say a normal sense of use, what I'm meaning is the word doesn't always have a spiritual connotation. We looked at examples from the life of Jesus. Uh, the disciples, of course, plead with Jesus to save them when they're in the boat in a storm on the Sea of Galilee. We talked about Jesus' plea to the Father to save him from the hour of persecution. And we looked at some examples from the end of Acts where Paul is on, a, on his mission or on the trip to appeal to Caesar, the charges against him and how their hope gradually was given up as far as, as being rescued. So the word can be used in a just a normal everyday sense and being saved from physical distress or danger. So you've got to read carefully to know when that happens. By and large, though, the word is used in the New Testament to talk about salvation from sin, and that's, of course, our focus in this study. We did highlight as well that, again, you read carefully in Scripture because the word or the concept of salvation is, is uh, used in its various tenses. We looked at several examples of how salvation is viewed as a past event, something that has taken place at a particular point in time earlier in a believer's life. So uh, you could can be said, you have been saved or I am saved. Then we talked about how it's also viewed in scripture as an ongoing event or process in the sense of Bible, the Bible talking about someone is being saved. It's uh, an ongoing thing. Yes, it happened at one point in time, but yet it's an ongoing process according to the work of God. Then finally, we discussed how there's also the concept of salvation being a future reality, something to which the believer anticipates or desires to, to reach. And we looked at Bible examples of that as well. It's the idea of, be, of inheriting salvation. Well, I thought you already had it. Well, yes, you do, but that there's a reality yet in the future. So uh, we need to understand that right off the bat because some people take these statements and say, well, look, the Bible contradicts you. So are you saved or are you being saved or will you be saved? And the answer, of course, is yes in, in all cases. We did end by highlighting the fact that salvation is a gift of God. That's going to come up again today in this study, so I won't go over that too much in depth. We'll talk about a little bit more, but that needs to be foundational as well. Anything associated with salvation, of course, is, is begins with God and ends with God. All right, that leads us into today's study, and in this particular lesson, we're going to discuss how salvation, according to Scripture, is truly God-centered. God, <clears throat> excuse me, is at the center of this salvation process. Yes, those of us who respond to God's gift of grace, there's a, a role we play in that. 
but yet salvation is a gift of God that is centered in his work and desire for mankind. Let's look at the various ways the Bible speaks of, the, of salvation being God-centered. First of all, we have a couple of instances at least where we learn that salvation is the will of God. It's something God wants, something God desires for his creation. It's not something God you know, thought up at the last minute or anything like that. It's part of his will. We see it in places like 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4, of course, the opening verses in this chapter, verses 1 and 2, we find that in the context, Paul is encouraging Timothy and others who would read the letter to pray for leaders so that they might lead, the Christians might lead a quiet life. It's, it's a, a good thing for believers to pray for those who have authority over them. But notice the reason why it's encouraged. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4 says, Paul writes, This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. All men and women, every creature, as far as humankind is concerned, we read here that it's God who desires that. So again, salvation isn't something that, uh, you know, God says, well, I can take it or leave it. You know, no, it's something that's according to his will. Perhaps you desired in the past to study and know the will of God. Well, this is one thing you can be sure of. As Paul says, it's God's desire <clears throat> for all men to be saved. Once again, I, it's these kind of verses that, that uh, cause me to have great problems with some forms of religious understanding out there that promote the idea that, you know, salvation is only for the elect. God really only desires the salvation of those whom he's chosen from all eternity to be saved. Uh, but this verse, you know, contradicts that. God desires everyone to be saved. Now, does that mean all will be saved? Of course not. The Bible is clear about that as well. Some will steadfastly refuse to accept what God offers, but that doesn't take away from the fact that God desires all men to be saved. <clears throat> we see it emphasized once again in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, in this context, of course, Peter is writing about those who are mocking Christians for one reason or another, especially about the fact that, well, you Christians have said the Lord's coming back and he hasn't done that yet. Well, in verse 9 of 2 Peter 3, he says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Now, that says nearly the same thing Paul says back in 1 Timothy 2, doesn't it? Here, it's Peter writes it this way, God doesn't wish or will, if you will, desire. God doesn't desire for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And once again, that's that's an all-encompassing invitation, isn't it? God doesn't want any to perish. The, the flip side of that would be God would want all people to be saved, just as, as Paul said. So Paul and Peter agree here. Salvation is according to the will of God. It's something God wants. It's something God desires. It's something God is endeavoring to bring about. So that's point number one. As we discuss salvation, know that it's centered in God, it's centered in his will. Secondly, scripture is also clear that salvation is the work of God. Not only is it the will of God, but it's also the work of God. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verses 8 and 9 highlight this passage. Second Timothy 1, 8 and 9 says, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Now, one thing young Timothy was battling, and, and one reason for which Paul was writing him is to encourage him in his job as, as a preacher and teacher for the church in Ephesus. He was young, and that was causing some problems, 
but apparently there was uh, Timothy was feeling a measure of of shame for the cause, and uh, Paul says, "Don't do that. Don't be ashamed," as well. But he brings it all back to God again, He's talking about the gospel there in verse eight. Join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, according, not according to our works, but according to his purpose or grace, or if you will, his works. So you see, salvation, according to the Apostle Paul, is a work of God. We're not saved because God has looked at our works, because all of our works is as the Old Testament highlights are like filthy rags. We can't approach God on the basis of our merits, but yet it is according to the work of God, his purpose, his grace, his will, as we've already seen. Salvation, though, is a work of God, not a work of man. Last week, we looked at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Let's read it again. Very important section of scripture in the doctrine of salvation. <clears throat> Paul says, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ or saved us with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. And you catch the wording there. Once again, it's because God is merciful, because God has a great love for us. He made us alive or saved us, if you will, even when we were dead in our transgressions. So it can't be by our works. The plan of God was initiated before, uh, you know, at the foundation of the world. We'd be saved in Christ. He made that plan possible. But it's by his work. That's what we're emphasizing here. I would remind you as well of Philippians 2, verse 12, once again. This causes a little bit of confusion in religious circles. Philippians 2 verse 12 says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So which is it then, some would say, am I saved by my work or by God's work? Well, as I said at the beginning, there's a, there's a role in which we play in this. But it's God's work. We never want to forget that. Working out our salvation, of course, is just, just responding to God and, and cooperating, if you will, with his work in our life. It's not on the basis of our own works or merits, as we've seen very clearly here. So working out our salvation is not in the sense, well, I need to be good enough before God will save me. So we've already seen that that's not the case. Working out our salvation then would be our willingness to submit to God and uh, follow him in faith and accept the gift of grace. So salvation number one is according to the will of God. Salvation is the work of God. We also learn that salvation is the goal of God. It's what God, as we said earlier, desires, but it's something God uh, planned for again from the beginning. It's what he purposed. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 9 and 10 make this pretty, pretty clear. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 9 and 10, speaking of the fact that salvation is the goal of God, <clears throat> says, for God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Those early words there in that verse are very important. God has not destined us. See, it's destined here is, is uh, talking about the purposes of God, the goals of God. It's not God's goal for us to experience his wrath. God didn't create us just so he could, he could pour out his wrath upon us. That wasn't that way in the beginning. Sin ruined that. But God's, dest God's destiny for us wasn't judgment and wrath, but as the verse goes on to say, Paul says, but for obtaining salvation. God destined us to obtain salvation. It's what God wants, it's what God desires, what God is working for, as we've already said. We see it plainly as well in John 3, 16 and 17. 
we're all familiar with John 3, 16, aren't we? Very well-known verse, very important verse as far as the topic of salvation. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Praise God for that. God gave his Son so that we could be saved. Did you don't forget what verse 17 says as well, and it's important for this idea that salvation is the goal of God. Verse 17 of John 3 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Remember, God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world. That's the same thing Paul was saying when he said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10, God has not destined us for wrath. Here it says God did not send his son in the world to judge the world. That isn't God's goal, but that the world might be saved through him. God sent his son into the world with the goal of saving humanity, as many as can be saved. Again, as we said earlier, God's not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Salvation is the goal of God. It's the story of the Bible, if you will. God's rescue from the time sin entered the world, God's efforts from that point on have been to reconcile humanity to himself, as many as will answer the call. Let's look at number four. Number one, salvation is the will of God. Number two, salvation is the work of God. Number three, we've just seen salvation is the goal of God. We also learn that salvation is the choice of God. Salvation is the choice of God. Once again, these are just kind of looking at the same thing from a lot of different vantage points. But notice what is said in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 13 and 14 this time. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. Paul writes, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those words are important there, aren't they? It says, God, because, for the last part of verse 13, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Once again, if you take the Bible teaching as a whole, this isn't a choice of every individual who will ever be saved. It isn't that God destined from the beginning. Uh, individuals for salvation or condemnation as we've seen god desires all men to be saved that would contradict that idea so the, the sense here is god has chosen whoever will come from the beginning through sanctification in the spirit and faith and the truth and of course it's through the, the the work of his son jesus all those in christ have been chosen from the beginning for salvation ephesians 1 verses 3 and 4 Paul says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him. See, here's what I just explained a minute ago. Just as he, or God, chose us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, or if you will, saved. God chose us in Christ. Those in Christ, that was the choice of God. God would save who all would respond to Christ from the foundation of the world. Salvation is God's choice. Finally, we're talking here, we're emphasizing the Bible teaching that salvation is God-centered. Every basic principle associated with salvation has its origin with God. The final one here is one we talked about last week. We want to highlight it again because it's vital. Salvation is the gift of God. Salvation is the gift of God. Romans 6.23 plainly says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or if you will, salvation. The free gift of God is salvation. If you want the wages of sin, that's death. If you want salvation, that's going to have to come by a free gift of God. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says the same thing in just different words. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. 
you have been saved as a gift of God. Once again, not of our works, not by our own merits, not by our own efforts. It's God who initiated the process through Christ. That's why it's by his grace and mercy. By grace, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. One more verse here, as far as the choice of God or salvation being the gift of God, rather. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Titus 2, 11 and 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the presence of God. Once again, the grace of God appeared, and that's Jesus, bringing salvation to all men. See, we didn't possess it innately. We didn't earn it. It had to appear by the power and grace of God. God had to bring salvation to us as a gift. Finally, as we emphasize the fact that the process of salvation, the plan of salvation is centered in God, is the fact that salvation is the pleasure of God. Salvation is a pleasure of God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21. 1 Corinthians 1.21 says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. I love that wording there, here in the New American Standard, when it says God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached. You see some in Corinth where, where Paul was highlighting that some hear the gospel message and says, well, a crucified Savior, that's that's nonsense. Some stumbled over Christ. Some mocked Christ. But God was well pleased through that foolish message from a human perspective to save those who believe. That, again, beyond just the fact that it's God's desire for all people to be saved, but it's something that God desires to the point of being well pleased when it happens. Salvation is the pleasure of God. We see it in Ephesians 1, verses 7 and 8, when Paul writes, In him, or in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. I love that verbiage as well. This salvation, this forgiveness, again, is according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. That just highlights the pleasure of God. God is so... in, in Vested in the salvation of mankind that he lavishes his grace on those who respond. It's well pleasing to him that people are saved from their sins. Let me recap just quickly. Of course, we're focusing here in this lesson on the fact that Bible salvation, the salvation of humankind from their sin and restoring that relationship to God. That salvation is God-centered. Every way you look at it, it begins and ends with God. We've seen this in this lesson that salvation is God's will. It's God's work. It's God's goal. It's God's choice. It's God's gift. And it's God's pleasure. And when you just reflect on that, especially for those of us who are a Christian, what a blessing it is to be saved by God. For God to offer by his grace and mercy whatever we need to be right with him. I'm reminded as I close with one more verse from Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. Hebrews 2 and verse 3, the Hebrew writer just says, How will we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And that's true. When you think of all that God has poured into this rescue effort, how much God desires it and works toward that salvation in our life, how God has aimed for it from the very beginning, and he's chosen us. He wants to give us everything we need to be right with God, and it pleasures him to do so. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Can you imagine turning down that kind of gift when you think carefully about it? Why would any thinking person do that? There's no escape if you refuse to accept what God is endeavoring to do through Christ. Think about those things carefully, and Lord willing, next week we'll pick up in the study and look at another 
look at salvation from another angle. I hope the week ahead turns out to be a good one for you. God bless you richly, keep you well, healthy, and focused on his word, his work in your life. God bless.